traditional Swedish Christmas. Of course, like everywhere, that's going to be very different this year. You already feel it now, like in, in Stockholm, it's almost an eerie quietness around when you walk the streets. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. A career in hospitality can open up a world of opportunities. Applying one's trade as a chef means the chance to travel and work abroad is a very real prospect. The chance to absorb yourself in another culture, learn new techniques, learn how to use different ingredients too. For those willing, it can deliver a multitude of incredible experiences. Catherine Bond has joined the Punk Royale Group in Stockholm, Sweden. Catherine, how are you going? Yeah, good. I mean, as good as we can be in these weird and uncertain times, but I think everybody's feeling that across the world. What's it like in Sweden at the moment? There's all sorts of uh, lockdowns going on across Europe. What's, what's the situation in Sweden? Sweden has just last week introduced the 10 o'clock curfew um, for restaurants and bars, so no alcohol is to permitted to be served after 10 p.m. now, um, and guests must leave the premise by 10.30. But that's one of the first restrictions that's really been placed in Sweden during this period. Of course, there's been recommendations during this whole COVID period, and in general, the Swedish people and the restaurant owners have been you know, quite diligent in actually abiding by those but you know the virus has taken hold and still working havoc so they had to do something and this you know is yeah the first real one apart from during the summer actually putting in the regulation of first an arm's length distance between tables but that became very vague people were unsure you know whose arm what does that mean is that you know then they actually, I think it took their neighboring cousins, Denmark, to actually announce after the reopening when they just had a nearly nine week lockdown that they made it very clear each guest needs to have two square meters and there must be one meter between the tables. So then Sweden was like, okay, let's do a meter between the tables. Wow. Yeah. What's it felt like for you during this period being in Sweden? Yeah, it's been a a big adjustment. I mean, of course, I think moving to a new country and a new city after, you know, I lived eight years in Copenhagen, that coming to Stockholm, there's already a lot of new things to get used to and get settled and start to make my own friends and connections. Of course, I came up and moved very much into Jokke's already established life and connections here. But, you know, I was just starting to feel my way around this new city and then, you know, in in March when Denmark was, I think, one of the first countries to go into a full lockdown, um, that added to this <laughs> little bit of anxiety or what it was, but like, okay, a big part of my heart, I still feel like Denmark is home. And here they are announcing all of these regulations and stipulations and, and here I am in Sweden in Stockholm and not yet quite attaching to that in the way that I feel comfortable. I, I don't know. It's been, it's been a crazy few months. You mentioned uh, you spent eight years in Denmark and that was with uh, Noma. Um, have, you had, have you had communication with them and, and what they've been going through during this time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was just texting with James here a couple of days back and um, during the period as well, I think James was one of the first people I called um, when Denmark announced the lockdown because, of course, now joining the Punk Royale group, they have a restaurant in Denmark as well. But when this all happened so quickly, we weren't able to get to Denmark um, before the lockdown. So we were trying to communicate with the team there from Stockholm, you know, how we were going to go about transitioning into this phase of a lockdown period. And, you know, I I still hold the Noma team and the Noma family very dear to my heart and have so much respect for 
everything that they're doing and on the level that they have to deal with all of this as well. And yeah, it was, I had some phone calls and conversations just, you know, talking to them and, and seeing how, how they were doing because it's, it's been a, yeah, some crazy times. You were um, born in Australia. Can you, can you take us back to your early childhood? When did you first start getting interested in food? Oh, I've always, not always, but I grew up just with my father. I had a bachelor father who gr- brought up myself and my sister, who's seven years younger than me. Um, and so I also had to take on that motherly role a little bit from already when I was eight, nine years old. And I would find myself often cooking meals for the family, but actually really enjoying it as well. And my father is from a big Dutch family, 13 kids. So he's the youngest of the yeah, youngest of 13 kids. Um, and 11 of them boys as well, which is quite unbelievable. Um, so we had a big, big family, with lots of cousins and uncles and, you know, people we'd always be visiting and we moved around a lot. Like my dad would be like, okay, we're going Paul Macquarie. We're going to be there for a year or two. We're, I'm going to paint houses with this brother. And, oh, now we're going down here and south. And I'm going to be welding fishing boats. It's like, oh, okay. And so I, I think I lived in like 27 houses before I was 15. It's wow. crazy. Yeah. Um, which again, I think that's funny coming from a family who never traveled overseas, but we had this in us that, you know, moving around and being adaptable and adjusting to new places. That's something that I had from a very, very young age, but that also came with this love and this joy of sharing a meal. Like my father worked very hard to be able to look after my sister and I, that when we did have a meal time, we always made it something special. We'd always take the time to sit down together, to sit at the table, to set the table. Um, we had our traditions, our Friday fish and chips, our Sunday roast, our, you know, cooking breakfast together on the weekends. And so I'd always had that love and desire to, if there was some way I could make doing this, something that I love so much, my my career, then that would be the ultimate. You've worked in many venues, but where did you get a start in the industry? Uh, my very first job in the industry, I was 16 and got a job working at a place in Greenwell Point, so a couple of hours south of Sydney, at a place called Backgate Seafoods. So it was uh, it was in a place, Greenwell Point, which is known for their fish and chips and right on the harbour. And, you know, we actually lived there for a period in my teenage years. Um, Backgate Seafood was like the one level up, but not quite a restaurant, but, you know, still serving fresh caught fish and seafood and shellfish. But it also had like a takeaway retail counter. But in the in during the day and into the evening, you could actually sit outside and BYO alcohol. People would bring six packs of tinnies or a bottle of wine and um, sit outside. And then, I, so it was also a fun, like my first job in hospitality, I was doing everything from the retail side to actually serving and selling the seafood to cooking to, yeah, it was quite a start if you say that. You moved around a lot as a child, but you also travelled a lot for your career. Can you tell us a little bit about the sort of journey that you spent going around the globe um, cooking in various venues? Yeah, absolutely. So I left Australia for the very first time just after I'd turned 21, and the first stop was Thailand. And um, after saving up... All my tips for a year, I was working front of house at Est just before we left for for that first overseas trip, saved all my tips for a year and then was like, whoa, okay, if I live this backpacker lifestyle and stay in hostels and travel around on the local bus, I could have like a year off in Thailand. This is amazing, which I did. I had 11 months where I wasn't working per se and traveling around covering every corner of Thailand from 
all the way to the very, very north in the Golden Circle, down south, all the islands, and just learning, cooking, tasting, exploring. And it, it just, that trip blew my mind. It was absolutely incredible. Um, that was the first stop. And it was actually through a chance meeting another Australian girl who was working in Bangkok at the Metropolitan Hotel through a connection of David Thompson, uh, went to say hi to her and she was the executive chef for the whole Como Hotel group and um, offered a job to go for a season or a season, a Christmas period to the Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean. Um, so I jumped from like front of house at S, 11 months off in Thailand through this conversation, ended up in the Turks and Caicos Island back in the kitchen. Um, so living on a Caribbean Island, um, cooking, it was a private Island, thousand acres, um, 60 rooms would house like a hundred guests at a time, but had nearly 400 staff. So the delivery of product was quite incredible and, you know, there was no, no, whatever the guest asked for, we had to be able to provide. So it was also just even in that short period in Christmas, learning from the team that they had, okay, with ordering and things coming twice a week on air delivery. Otherwise, you know, every other week, a container coming from Miami, just being organized with orders. Okay. We need to have things here. We need to be able to change the menu every couple of days. Um, and then I also was private chefing. Like I, I had a position as a sous chef on the Island of one of the restaurants, but then I would also go into some of the homes. They had private homeowners on the Island and one particular family I cooked a lot for. So when they were there over their holiday period or um, whenever they would come to their house, which they actually built on the island, I would be in their home from morning till night cooking a multitude of meals. Yeah, so that was a that was an, a, a crazy, amazing adventure. And then after the one... Christmas period or Christmas New Year season, which was like four or five months, um, they actually asked if we'd stay one more year, so into the next Christmas, which I did. So I ended up being on the island for 18 months. Um, and from there actually f found contact or, yeah, made contact again with the Another Australian guy, so many Australian connections all over the world, but an Australian guy who'd been living in Japan already for like 10, 12 years. He'd married a Japanese woman and was making a name as an incredible architect and interior designer who was now based in Hokkaido in the northmost island. And he had um, bought an old Japanese pension or what we might think of like a hostel, like a, you know, 30 bed, you know, communal living rooms and an onsen in the basement, like these hot spring fed water baths. Um, but he would bought this old pension in Hokkaido in the very north of Japan in a ski resort and was redoing it into nine deluxe suites and then wanted to have some yeah, food and beverage outlets within there as well. And made connection with him, never been to Japan. Um, growing up, as I did on the east coast of Australia, going from there to Thailand to the Caribbean, I'd never seen snow. I'd never even really, if I think about it, seen leaves on a tree change color because I'd never been anywhere cold enough that that actually happened. Um, so I found myself after 18 months in the Caribbean, just, yeah, let's do it. I can get a working holiday visa to go and work in Japan, but that would require me to go home to Australia to do that. So I took those weeks in the transitional period to go home for a while, do the application, got the working holiday visa and showed up in Hokkaido in October. So also got to see the seasons change for the very first time and to see a Japanese maple turn red and all the leaves turn yellow. And then when it actually finally started to snow, that was, uh, yeah, quite the experience. 
was during your time in Hokkaido that the connection to Noma happened and sort of changed your path again. Can you tell us about what happened? Absolutely. So I was in Hokkaido and did four winter seasons there, so stayed for four years. Um, of course, it is a demanding and taxing, exhausting job doing seasonal periods, but, you know, the one good thing that come from that was eight weeks holiday a year, so being able to travel and continue to see the world. But after the fourth season and also tipped by the earthquake and the tsunami, which, you know, shook the nation and you could feel it was going to be some tough times ahead. And, you know, I was still in my, you know, late twenties, mid late twenties and full of energy and passion and excitement and always wanting to be learning. And, you know, it just seemed a natural tipping point, like, okay, this has been an incredible run. Now it's time to, to look for something new and didn't have really much more thought than that, but that it was clear, okay, once this winter season is over, I need to move on to the next challenge. And back then I, I remember it. I had a, an iPad on my first yeah, technological Apple products that my father actually got for me, this old big brick of a thing. Um, I was sitting on my iPad scrolling through Twitter and then this tweet came up from Rene Redzepi. I was like, Renee went zipping. Oh, yeah, that's uh, the chef of Noma. I was like, you know, I, and I remember it. It was almost word for word. I, I remember it saying, Are you a decent Homo sapien? We are looking for a passionate and enthusiastic individual to join the Noma team. And I was like, Hmm. I was like, That's, That could be me. And it was also a little bit vague, which I liked. It wasn't really what position or. You know, and I was like, hmm, but I mean, I can jump back in the kitchen or I can do the front of house. I, I'm pretty versatile in that sense as well. But this restaurant in the very north of Europe in Denmark, that, you know, sounds like it could be a fun challenge and something totally different from what I've been doing, running a hotel in the north of Japan. Let's send a message. And, you know, but of course, when I started to think about it and okay, I should do a little bit of a cover letter or, you know, and, and update my CV. I've been traveling and working a lot and now I find myself in Japan and how do I describe this position I've had for the last four years? And so, and I wanted to do it right. I didn't want to give away too much information. I still wanted to keep it brief. Um, so I started writing and um, had a very, very good friend in Hokkaido, another expat girl who married a Japanese guy, and she's still one of my very best friends. She's Italian-Canadian, so we also had a good connection and fun times finding ourselves as two girls living in the north of Japan. She said, she's like, don't be too nervous about it. Just, you know, put down your heart. And I did it, but it still took me a couple of days because I was like, oh, yeah, this, this is actually the world's best restaurant. <laughs> um, I don't want to stuff it up. Like, you know, I want to, okay. And then when I finally, two or three days later, was like, okay, back to Twitter. I need to find how do I submit this information. There was an email address on the tweet, and then I was like, oh, man, this tweet has been favorited a few thousand times. It's been retweeted across the world. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. This is normal we're talking about. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to send it, you know. What I just would hope for would be amazing that if, you know, a real human actually just responded to me regardless, you know, what the thought was. I am an Australian girl living in Japan with a Dutch passport. It's, it's all quite weird, but let's cross our fingers and see. And it, it took a couple of days and I was like, oh, okay, and then, you know, not sure. But And then all of a sudden this email popped up and the first email conversation was like, thank you so much for reaching out. We're so interested to talk more. Um, I think it would be great if you could come and meet the team. When can you be in Copenhagen? And I was like, Ugh. <laughs> Like I remember there's like sweat beads on my forehead and my palms. I was like, oh my God. Okay. Well, that was, uh, that was an answer. You could say that. Um, 
But just as quick as I got, I think before I even responded to the email, I was checking, like logging in, checking how, okay, how would I actually get to Copenhagen from the north of Japan? Okay, bus to Sapporo, the main city flying. Oh, there's a flight in five days. Yeah, okay, I'm going to email back and, you know, they seem serious, but I also want to show that I'm serious. This is something that I'm really ready to dive into so let's let's do it and I I did just that like I think it was one or two emails exchanged after that and then I bought a ticket flew to Denmark flew to Copenhagen my first time in that part of the world I'd never been that north in Europe or to Scandinavia and uh, I flew for a week my friend Joanna, this wonderful girl who still lives there with her husband, has one of the greatest bars in the world. Um, we sat over a drink at her bar the night before I left and she really helped me just get into the mindset of thinking like, you know, whatever happens, just go into this week. You're so fortunate. How many people would kill to be in that position that you're actually just going to spend a week at Noma? Just enjoy it. You ended up spending eight years there and yeah. doing the, the pop-ups in Japan, Australia, Mexico. What, what's been some of the real highlights for you and what did you get from working at Noma? Oh, I still, I mean, I had my last shift at Noma on December 7th, 2019. So it's still less than a year ago that I finished that huge chapter in my life. And I still, to this day, I, I find myself processing and digesting. And there were so many huge milestones. And of course, all the pop-ups are a very big thing. And after the four years in Hokkaido, coming to a restaurant in Denmark and spending some time there. Oh, we're going to take the team to Japan. I was like, well, that's interesting. I can help with that. I lived there a few years. I think I learned a few tricks and things along the way of how it is working with Japanese culture and people. And um, so that was a huge moment to return to Japan with the Noma team. But then also sitting at breakfast in Kyoto after we'd finished the Noma pop-up in Tokyo, I remember this conversation so well. It was again James, the other Australian restaurant manager and now partner at Noma, Renee, his wife and kids, we were sitting at the breakfast table and you know, it's like this has been one of the most incredible experiences ever and that we're all here together. He's like, we're going to do it again next year. And I was like, Oh, wow, okay, that's a crazy idea. He's like, yeah, but we're going to go to Australia. And I was like, I think I stopped breathing. I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, we're going to do it. I was like, oh, my goodness. So from that moment, I mean, we're still sitting in Japan and then already the talks of Australia and um, then the next, you know, the next six, eight months being back in Denmark, it was still – we had Noma Restaurant open, but became very much a part of, together with Annika, the project manager, and of course Ben Liebman, who you spoke to, and you know, getting ready to take the Noma team to Australia. That was, I mean, a standout and simply amazing. But I, I had the same or a different excitement then for the third pop up when we went to Mexico, because that was also a part of the world I'd never been to. And I went early, I was there, you know, five, six weeks before the opening of Noma Mexico with the test kitchen and very much a part of and involved with all the setup of everything. And um, so they've all been amazing. But then to actually reflect and look back on it, then they've all been like training camps to get ready to open Noma in its new location. So I just, every day I feel so fortunate and humbled and proud that I was able to be a part of so many huge milestones of that that family and that restaurant and everything that it's done. You mentioned it's not quite a year since you left Noma, but what, what drove you to that decision to make the change in your life? It was love. Because if you asked me Two years ago, you know, if it was even a thought, oh, what would be the next stop after Noma? And I was so 
content and happy and challenged and excited every day of going to work. And as you see now, it's like even during this time, they open next week Popple, the burger bar. They just, Heart Bakery keeps expanding. I, I feel with a with a company like Noma and everything that they're attached to and involved in, there's endless opportunities. Endless opportunities. It's really what you make of it and people that have expressed desire or interest to do other things there's so many possibilities so I you know I would have imagined I'd grow old at Noma it's quite a crazy thing but um, I fell in love with Joachim one of the owners of Punk Real, and we yeah of course things sometimes happen quite fast and escalate rapidly and it was the summer of 2019 where I actually spent quite a lot of time in Sweden because I'd just had surgery on both my hands and I was unable to work and wasn't going to sit in Denmark by myself. But, you know, so I spent a lot of time with Joachim's family and, you know, when he was in Sweden a lot, which he was last year because the Punk Real Group bought their fourth restaurant here in Stockholm. Um that after the summer when we'd been in Sweden a lot and we returned back to Denmark and I was starting up back at work after these months off and Jochen was still travelling, you know, several times a week he was doing the flight or the train back and forth from Copenhagen to Stockholm and it was like <laughs> we didn't even really talk about it. We were sitting, I think, over breakfast and I said to Jochen, I was like, this isn't really like, you need to have your base in Stockholm. To me, it's very clear now with this new project. And, of course, you still have a restaurant in Copenhagen, but you have three now in Stockholm. And I think in order for the team in Copenhagen to really be able to step up and take the responsibility, it's also something that you need to be able to let go of in a way. It's been open. It was nearly two years at that point. And, you know, you know I think it's something that you need to consider um, and he's like, but move, move back to Stockholm. What does that mean? And I was like, no, I'm going to come with you. And that's basically how it happened. It, it wasn't like I even had to go through in my head, okay, I'm leaving Noma. It was like, no, I'm moving to Stockholm. My life is now at a point where, you know, I feel almost needed there. I want to be there to support Joachim. Um, and that's how... That's how it happened. So it was, of course, with moving countries, it doesn't really make it that easy to go to work every day at Noma in Copenhagen when I moved to Stockholm. So that was kind of like the second thing. But, um, yeah, that was going back to work in October after those months, telling James and Annika, the now GM, right away. And it's like, yeah, I think up until – the end of the year but then I'm going to find myself adjusting to a new life in Stockholm which I don't even know what that means yet but like everything else I'm just going to dive in and give it my best and here we are. Well your new role in Stockholm is still taking shape but what what is your role within the group? So I joined the Punk Rao group in January this year um and Joachim is still very much has his eyes and ears and hands and fingers in all of the four units. He's very much, you know, creatively guiding with everything on the menus, very much the experience and the hospitality and everything that comes with it. And and I'm yeah, I think we named my role when I first joined like guest experience yeah something with guest experience because it, it is a big big part of the punk Rao group's restaurants the actual experience and the hospitality and the way in which things are delivered so I've been working very much with that but of course in this time and this period my experience in everything I've learned in my years at Noma I've also been very much involved with the team during this global pandemic, which has thrown all sorts of curveballs. And, you know, we've had to be constantly making adjustments to schedules and 
also with bookings and cancellation policies and seating times and table spacings. And so it's been a very fluid transition, if you say like that. I find myself very busy every day with a multitude of different tasks. Um, and I think while we're still in this period where we are now, it's, it very much is about that. It's taking every day as it comes, learning from the days that have passed, how we can move forward. We're very much about keeping the team together. It's been difficult times, you know, talking to the team in Copenhagen that went through an eight, nine-week lockdown, you know, how to keep stimulated and how to keep, you know, um, preparing to reopen after all these weeks closed, like so I have, together with Jokke, m- most of the time as well, but I think since May when Copenhagen reopened after the lockdown, we've been back and forth like six or seven times. Um, so we're there to support them and help them and, you know, just be there to guide them. And, um, you know, and it, it's also been – so valuable to go down there and talk with the team in Copenhagen, not only at Punk Royale, but then, of course, responsibly meeting up with and seeing old colleagues and friends from Noma and stopping by Hart Bakery for a coffee and, you know, but and just coming back with all that information and that we are able to share and learn from our colleagues over in Denmark and bring that back to Stockholm and vice versa. We're also experiencing things and learning things every day in Stockholm where they're doing it quite different to Denmark and, you know, feeling a little bit like this buffer in the middle. It's like, you know, it's not to say that one is doing it better than the other, but they are having quite different approaches. And we're just making sure to follow all the recommendations and guidelines. And whenever we're traveling, of course, we do it responsibly and, um, but, you know, when we are transitioning between the two cities to actually, yeah, be be constantly open and, you know, also willing to share what we've experienced and learned along the way. The restaurants in the Punk Royale group are quite different to Noma. Could you give us a, a sense of what the offering is with them? So the original Punk Royale restaurant in Stockholm, which opened a little over five years ago, um, it's a tiny space. I think it's like 50 square meters, the entire building. It's absolutely crazy. And it's a tiny part of the thing and the experience of that punk real is that, you know, it's quite a tight packed environment. It's this tiny little kitchen. The tables used to be quite close together. Of course, now they're much further apart, but it's like loud music smoke machines, lasers, UV lights, graffiti, madness. And the team, it's like they have the most amazing team of people working in the restaurants in, in Stockholm here in Sudamam. It's like they're performers in a way. They come in, they have like little groups, they organize, they have themes some days, they dress up as Tiger King one weekend. It's like you walk into this place and they're like covered in glitter. You know, they they get into character. But also the thing is the table is laid with a crisp white tablecloth. It's got like a beautiful antique brass candle holder on it. And you know that it's like it really is a play with these two worlds. It's punk in a bit of the attitude and of course the environment but the royale comes with it's like Jokke was first head chef of a two-star here in Sweden and ex Baka and he's like quite yeah he's I mean he loves truffles he loves caviar he loves all of these things he's the biggest buyer of most of them I think in the whole of northern Europe it's absolutely crazy that then you also it's like you're in this environment and and then someone like feeds you with a spoon, this lobster set mushroom puree mountain with grated black truffle over it. Like you just, things happen so fast. The next thing you're getting caviar spooned on your hand and a shot of ice cold vodka. But then you also get, I mean, the menu at the moment is around 20 servings and that's it. When you book a seat at Punk Royale, a little bit like Noma in the same sense as well. It's like you don't know what you're getting yourself in for, like what the menu is right at this period, right in this time. 
pretty much guaranteed you're going to get caviar, lobster, truffles. That's a given. But outside of that could be, you know, sometimes it's more smaller snack servings. Sometimes it's more plated dishes. Depends on the time of year and the products, of course. But it is a all-in package. So once you sit down, um, all the food and all the beverages, of course, there is an option with an alcohol-free beverage pairing, which the team there make all different sort of concoctions and juices and infusions. And the, the experience shouldn't be any less if you're not drinking alcohol. But of course, part of the whole thing for a lot of people coming to Punk Real is that you just sit down, turn off, and you give in for the experience. You just sit back and enjoy the ride because it's a couple of hours of just, you know, drinks and food and things and music. And and the demand, like the Punk Real original restaurant, this small one I'm talking about, like 50 square meters or what it is, it's a tiny place. They also have two doors down, so it's not connected, but on the same street is what has been known as Punk Real Cafe, which became like the little sister punk row and it's a much bigger venue it's actually got like a mezzanine floor um where they have the capacity to do like double maybe triple the amount of guests um and it had been for the past several years actually doing a lighter version of punk row so it didn't come with the beverage package you had more flexibility with the menu it didn't have to end up being this 20 serving you know, course menu. But actually that's been one of the biggest changes in this corona period is that both restaurants now in Stockholm, both the Punk Real units, if we say like that, are actually doing the all-in package in order, like the demand was more there for people wanting to actually come out and have this, you know, responsible but experience, you know, they wanted to come and, and be taken care of. And so now both venues in Stockholm are doing the same all-in total over delivery package. Um, it's also an interesting thing at the Punk Rails in Stockholm that when you arrive and you sit down, there's like a small cash box on the table. And when you get greeted before you get your first drink, it's actually required that everyone on the table locks their phone away. So it also adds a bit to this like mysteriousness of punk rock because there's not been that much photos or especially from guests really flying around the internet because it's been kind of kept secret if you say like that. It's more about being present, enjoying the experience, people talking about it. The word of mouth travels so far. I mean, in, in Stockholm, it's a phenomenon. Still five years later, you know, the waiting list, it, it's an absolutely crazy place. But, um, so that's the two restaurants in Stockholm. And then the punk, the punk Real in Copenhagen opened two and a half years ago now, nearly three years in January, actually. And then, but then the fourth restaurant, Coco and Carmen is quite, quite different. So it's not smoke machines and lasers and, it's still, it's a neighborhood restaurant in what is, you know, the more fancy side of Stockholm, if you say it's located in a part of town called Ustamam. Um, it's been a neighborhood restaurant for 40 years run by a couple actually called Coco and Carmen. So he, Coco was the gentleman and Carmen was the lady. Um, and it became a, a lunch institution. Like people would come there but they were serving a sort of dish of the day for lunch and never really had much of a dinner offering. They would occasionally like for a large group book out and do a very simple dinner menu. But last year in the summer in July, the Punk Rao group took over Coco and Carmen and now offer there. Also, it's a, at lunch, it's a set menu, a lighter version. You get like five, six servings. And at dinner, it's like 10, 11 servings. But that's that's it. There you can choose whether you want to do an alcoholic or a non-alcoholic pairing. Or, of course, you have the flexibility with ordering a la carte, just having a bottle of wine or a glass of something. But it, it's still for the food part of the experience that's curated and taken care of by 
punk rock to deliver you the best. And you see the truffles, you can have the caviar and vodka. and But it, it's a more, you know, what some might feel is a more classic restaurant. The, the windows you can see through. It's not that you walk into this dark room with UV lights. It's a more classic dining room in that way. What's the sense there at the moment? There's been cases rising. What's what's it feel like uh, for you? What's the next couple of months look like for Sweden? Yeah, it's – I know from being here in Sweden last year around this time or this time like towards the end of December that a huge thing for Sweden is Christmas and these Christmas tables. Um, quite often it's usually – these company Christmas lunches that, you know, go on for sometimes it feels like days where you have all of a sudden a work lunch and then a family lunch and a friend's lunch and you go out for these big Christmas buffets. Everyone gets absolutely wasted. You feast on all the traditional traditional Swedish Christmas fare, like, of course, all the herring and and, and, and it's like that, of course, like everywhere, that's going to be very different this year. You already feel it now. Like in in Stockholm, it's almost an eerie quietness around when you walk the streets. And people are being, you know, they're they're staying home. You feel this. there's not going to be these big gatherings and groups of people. One, they're not allowed. And I think, you know, it doesn't just seem right to be pushing to even consider things like that right now. But that's where... Punk Real is, and the Punk Real group are continuing to remain open in the restaurants and, you know, it's maximum party size of eight, but it still is an environment and a place where people can still come and have some kind of gathering together with loved ones and friends. And, and I think that's something that we're trying to create an environment where people feel able to come out and share time together responsibly. But it's also, I mean, things are just changing every day. I I really feel, and we see here, you know, there's still announcements of press conferences and, you know, the possibility and potential that things will change. But as it seems at the moment, I think, where we are right now in Stockholm with regulations and it's going to be like this until at least the end of February. So I think it's also just to think about, okay, well, we need to work with what we have and not, yeah. You, you started building a new life a year ago in Stockholm. What, what are you most looking forward to um, beyond covid What I'm most looking forward to is actually returning home to Australia to visit my family because that's it's been four and a half years. I haven't been home since Noma, Australia. Of course, things happen. It was like pop-up in Australia, preparing for a pop-up in Mexico, coming back under the bridge, opening the new Noma. There's... You know, it was nonstop there, changing, transitioning into seasons. And, you know, there's always this like, yeah, we're going to come. We were going to go at Christmas last year. But with everything going on, it was just too tight because Joachim's also never been to Australia. So I don't want to take him for his first time and be like, okay, we have two weeks. But my family's everywhere from Toowoomba to Brisbane to sit. Like it just wouldn't even be possible. So I was like, no, no, we're not going to rush it at Christmas let's go in March. And we'd actually postponed our trip to the end of March, um, which of course didn't happen. Um, and now it's actually for the first time in my adult life, I feel this feeling like the uncertainty of not knowing when I can go home is actually really, really difficult. You know, I just want to go and give my family a hug. I want to see my dad. I want to see my sister, my little niece. And, you know, I I think it's a weird thing. And, of course, I miss travel and being able to freely pass between, you know, 
different places. I feel we're so fortunate in Europe to be able to do that. But also at the same time, I think Corona has made me just like <sighs> breathe out for a minute and slow down. And, you know, we're, everything was moving so fast before. And it was always this like, you know, the next thing, the next thing. So, you know, just popping around for the sake of doing it, of course, part of me misses it, but I also feel refreshed by not having it for a while. Um, and, yeah, I think it's, you just feel this, even though the world has slowed down, you feel, I feel it with people around us, not only within our group and colleagues and friends, and but, you know, the, there's this different, like, anxiety and, pressure on people because of everything that's going on and I just would wish for on the other side of COVID for myself and also for the people around me just uh, yeah just removing this uncertainty like not knowing what's around the corner mm. or when it's gonna feel better. Well Catherine um, you've just shared the most extraordinary story um, amazing. Well, I do, and I do hope that you guys can get down to Australia soon so you can see your family. Uh, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds and hearing your story. Please keep in touch and we'll talk again soon. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Thank you for having me. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>